If you'd like to help Carlton keep producing the Black Spy podcast and receive episodes and information that's only available to Carlton's special Patreon agents, then you can donate as little as £3, €4 Euros, or $5 a month by signing up with Patreon. See the Black Spy podcast notes or Google Patreon Black Spy podcast and pledge your monthly amount. You can even win the opportunity to be a guest on the show. Thanks for listening. And don't forget to subscribe for free. My name is Carlton King. Welcome to the Black Spy Podcast, a show that shines a light on the world of secret intelligence, national security, and armed governmental personal protection operations, but actually majors now on geopolitics, the everyday connection between the politics of the world and an everyday life that we, the people, live, and the subjects which are around that. So for the last couple of weeks, I've done something with Fergus Isaac, journalist, publicist, all-round top lady. And today, what we want to do is look at one of the burning issues of today. And she's kind of going to surprise me with it. So we're going to flow because it's going to be sort of off the cuff. And I just want to get the feel from Fergus about what's happening now, what she thinks is trending, and what maybe can be done about it. So, Fergus, once again, good evening to you. (laughs) Thank you, Gordon. As I say, it is always, always a pleasure to talk to you. But I just wanted to start off this episode by saying, by the way, for the last... For the last one that we did, we got a fan letter. Well, I say letter, we got fan email. Did you know that? No. <laughs> so oh, I'm, 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 not gonna, I'm not I'm not going to read it out. I'm not going to read it out. But I'm just going to say we got a fan email. So if anyone's listening to this podcast now and feels like that they feels like they want to comment or, you know, tell us something something positive or, or tell, us, tell us how their day is going or whatever. You know, that was that was really unexpected and very nice. <laughs> Super duper. Happy with that. Anyway, right. So look, um, I thought today we could talk about crime. Right now, I know that's a big subject. I know that's a big subject, but um, in I would say, you know, everyone knows people that people that know of you or people that have heard of you or people that have read your book think of you as the black spy. You know, I reckon if you went to a dinner party and you were sat at a table next to someone you never met, you know, they'd come away knowing all about the, you know, about the MI6 part of your career. Yeah. Um, but fewer people know that you work your way up through the Met and that actually your relationship with uh, with the police, um, it, 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 is, it is, is, well, to me, very much just as interesting as your... Um, my primary essence. As your undercover career, I suppose, right? Yeah. So, um, crime, now look, crime to me means something punishable by the judicial system. But if you look at the way that the media portrays crime, you know, some of it gets way more airtime than others. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, I mean, I would I would love to know. And let's let's just park this question and talk about it in a minute about how, you know, about the different types of crime. But um, today, um, the the Met Police Chief, Sir Mark Rowley, uh, said he promises uh, what did he say? More, more, more trust, less crime, and higher standards. Right, and that and that was all over the press today, right? And mm. he, but basic, but but essentially, what he was saying was that you know, he he wants to whistleblow. You know, he wants to 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 unpick the Met. He wants to 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 raise the standards. He wants to sort of investigate internally. But sort of between the lines, what he was saying was that um, the government isn't su- supporting him. Interesting. I, I I actually don't know what he means by saying he wants to whistleblow. What does he well, What does he, he said, kind okay, of mean? Let me find the quote. Okay, let me find the quote. He said this on on Radio Force Today program, right? He said, "My mission 
is about more trust, less crime and high standards. That is what everything needs to revolve around through these three thoughts, building the trust in communities, tackling crime and high standards is, is, is and that is what we're going to do. We're never going to turn up every single crime. The public understand that. But something as severe as burglary needs proper policing response. It's too serious an intrusion to have not to have somebody turn up. Right. But then he says, um, hold on, let me find, find the exact quote. Then he talks about things like the murder of Sarah, Sarah, uh, Sarah Everard, mm -hmm. the Charing Cross racism storm, um, mm -hmm. the, the, the two police officers who took photographs of the female murder victims. Mm -hmm. And he said, I know the public are intelligent and they know a massive organisation can't be perfect, but what they won't forgive us for is not being ruthless about rooting out those who have let us down and we have failed to do that and we won't be doing that on my watch. And then, okay. says, <laughs> and, and, and then essentially he, he, he goes on to talk about um, how he... He, want, he he says, I'm quite happy to be held to account on very high standards in terms of how I got hold of this issue and how to attack. But it does seem slightly ridiculous that I don't have the final word on who is in the final organisation. I don't know what he means by that. Well, it's it's in, it's it's yeah, it's, it is ambiguous, isn't it? Yeah, so, so, because he does so have the final word on who's in the organisation if he's the commissioner. Hmm. Um, he, he's the commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, or to be precise, the commissioner of the Metropolis, as the word was, not to be confused with police and crime commissioners who are individuals who, you know, I'm a criminologist, you know that, I studied hmm. criminology and that's what, what my degree is in. So basically, up until quite recently, when the Conservative government brought in these police and crime commissioners, outside of London, and that's important, there was a triumphant of individuals who controlled the police. So that was the, the watch committees, the policing committee from the councils and the Home Office. They put that into a singular body called the Police and Crime Commissioners. They are not police, have nothing to do with it. They said they weren't going to be politicians, but practically every man jack of them is a politician. And they go down on party lines now. So you've got Labour Police and Crime Commissioners, Conservative Police and Crime Commissioners, uh, Lib Dem Police and Crime Commissioners. So it's made policing very political. And what their job is, is not to deal with everyday policing, i.e. the operational policing, but to set a strategic overview as to what police should do in areas. Now, that was outside of London. In London, the mayor of London is in, has that role and has had it for some time in tandem with the Home Secretary, because prior to 2000, the Met Police was controlled directly by the Home Secretary in terms of the political running of that. So it's gone through quite a few different uh, versions thereof, but where we now are is that the mayor and now it seems the Home Secretary have the final say on whom is the commissioner now. Because you know that the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, tried to fire our previous commissioner, right? And the Home Secretary made it very clear that he cannot do that by himself. He has to have her say. So there was a big battle between them two, and she then resigned. Now, this is the question from what he's saying. In terms of day-to-day -day and even strategic overview of operational policing, the commissioner of the metropolis can hire whom he wants and fire whom he wants in line with the laws of the land. Of course, you can't just fire anybody because there's employment rights like anybody else. Um, now, to explain my position in terms of policing, I was a metropolitan police officer so when I joined the Met, that's what I was. I did two years doing, uh, well, eight, uh, six months of that, eight, six to eight months of that is in the training college, as it was at the time. And then thereafter, you did 18 months probationary period. Uh, after that, two years, you're now a regular constable. So you've now got all the powers of a police constable. And by the way, I will come to explain that, why that's important. So then what happens is, 
that you can then specialise. Now, obviously, most people don't specialise. They carry on being uniform constable, doing uniform work for a while, and then maybe three, four years, whatever, then try and get into a specialisation. But actually, most don't. Most stay through the whole career um, in general duty policing, be that uniform, be that CID or whatever. What happened is with me, my aim was always to join the Metropolitan Police Special Branch out of Scotland Yard, whose work is was, it's now disbanded, was secret intelligence work and national security work. It was a police body that was formed to do that. I should say back in 1883, before there was an MI5, before there was an MI6. And indeed, the head of that organisation in 1909 of the Met Special Branch, when he had to retire, then formed MI5 and MI6. That's the way it worked. So the first intelligence and security service of Great Britain was the Metropolitan Police Special Branch. That's what I was part of. I then subsequently was seconded to MI6, where I did my work in MI6. So I was always a police officer. Yes, I was a rare type of police officer because, uh, frankly, there wasn't any other person in MI6 who was a police officer, but that I was still a police officer, effectively. So I understand policing, um, and I understand where that's coming from, and I was part of the Met in Scotland Yard Special Branch. Right, so that's cleared up. Now, the commissioner saying what he's saying, I question that. Um, two things. In the British police, the powers that allow you to police come because generally you are a constable. There are a few laws which say an inspector can do X, Y and Z and a superintendent can do X, Y, and Z. So a superintendent can read the Riot Act. An inspector can section somebody under mental health. But other than that, the vast majority of the laws say a constable may, a constable shall, a constable uh, could, et cetera, et cetera. So the powers that allow you to arrest people all come because you're a constable. Yeah? And that's the role you have. If I, the reason why I mention that, if you go to somewhere like France, a lot of the powers that people get to arrest people only come if you are a judicial inspector, inspector judiciary. If, you, if you're not that, you can't arrest certain types of people for certain things. Um, so in Britain, let me give an example. Um, as a police officer, England and Wales, because Scotland have different, have different laws in England and Wales, you can, um, what you suspect... Uh, uh, an arrestable offence has been committed, a constable may arrest any person whom he suspects has committed that offence. So that's two suspicions. So you suspect there's been an offence that so you don't know, and you suspect that that's the person who's committed it, and you can arrest that person. That's awesome power. That isn't, as far as I know, and I've worked in most places, a power that's handed out to uh, any constable, any officer in Europe. That's just the British police of that. That's just the way our laws are. So now there's a bit of a problem, though, because you can arrest anybody, of course, and, you can, and you've can you got to get the evidence and bring it together. But can you charge them? Now, in the old days, you could charge them. Right? Now, however, the charging authority, nine times out of ten, is the Crown Prosecution Service. So what the police do is they arrest people. And I'll give you the famous Lawrence case. Well, the yeah, police... exactly. I mean, the Stephen Lawrence case broke the mould, didn't it? I mean... Famous example. Famous example. What happened was this. Stephen was killed, murdered by racists. The investigation took place. It stuttered a little bit on the first two or three days because there were other crimes going around and they tried to bring things together. But by day 10, and I've just had on the Northwest Regional Chief Prosecutor from the CPS, who was at the time down in London. And he did not deny this. By day 10, the police had arrested four individuals for the murder of Stephen Lawrence. Right? They then put it to the CPS, Crown Prosecution Service, who take the cases in court. Those are the prosecutors, the people who stand in front of a judge and put the evidence to them. So you've got to get their evidence. And that was 
you know, that started only in 1986. Before then, you didn't have that. The police charged people. But now, since then, it's the Crown Prosecution Service. And they said there is not enough evidence for you to charge these people. Right? So they had to be released. Three of the four people, several years later, as you know, those same four who were arrested, three of them were then found guilty when other cases were taken against them. So what I'm saying to you is within 10 days, the police had them. But when you hear all the propaganda on the street, oh, the police didn't do this, they didn't do that, didn't do it. It's the same people they had. The mm. CPS said you haven't got enough evidence. And you know how the CPS weighed the evidence up in those days? They said if there isn't a 60-40 chance of an offence being found guilty in court, we do not take the case to court. That's not the police saying this. That's the Crown Prosecution Service saying this. Mm. But, of course, when it goes wrong, the police take the hit. Mm. And, you know, I'll tell you, one of the standout things about the, Stephen Law the whole Stephen Lawrence thing and the way the media portrayed it and, and all the rest of it, I remember Theresa May um, at the time, who, uh, who was Home Secretary, right? And she, 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 she called the way that the police had acted, she used the word devastating. And, and I remember thinking... That's quite interesting, given that you're the Home Secretary. <laughs> Correct. It's interesting because I don't think people understand policing. Uh, and I don't think the Home Secretary does either, nine times out of ten. They, they seem to think that the lower the rank, the less the power. The truth of the matter is, as I've just explained to you in many ways, the power is derived in the officer's constable. So even as the commissioner, the only reason he can arrest people is because he's a constable, not because he's the commissioner. Mm. Do you see what I'm saying? So you can say to an officer, and I was a relatively senior officer, you can say to an officer, arrest that man over there, right, to a PC. And that PC can say to you, well, I didn't see anything. If you saw something, Governor, you arrest him. Because the power lies with the constable. And, the, and, and each individual has to be decisive for their actions. Do you get what I'm saying? Mm, yeah. So you have to stand in front of a court and say, this is why I arrested that person. So it isn't sufficient for you to just say, oh, my governor told me to arrest him. I didn't say anything. Mm, right? Yeah, so, absolutely. So, it's, so, it's a level of accountability, actually. Correct. That, 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 that sort of, that, that you can't really equate to, 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 to many other professions. Correct. Nine times out of ten, what you get is a politician who, by the way, you've got to understand our system, how it works. Politicians come into power, then what happens is the executive is created. So the executive is the prime minister, the secretaries of state underneath him, and underneath the secretaries of state, ministers of state, et cetera, et cetera. Right. They're all chosen by the prime minister or his cohort. They're not meant to be a president, so they're meant to work together to form this body of people who become the executive. You've then got the legislature, which is the normal MPs who are legislating and making the laws. And obviously, all of the executive are also in our system and generally also MPs as well. So what happens is then the, the, the executive carry out the functioning of the state. So they make somebody the Home Secretary, right? There has never been a Home Secretary who is a police person, ever. Right. So these are people who've come from any role, whatever they do, you know, they could be anything, doctors, lawyers, um, could be anything. And you, you name a job, it could be them, you know. Um, reporters. <laughs> reporters, absolutely, many reporters. And then you give them this job, you say, you are now the Home Secretary. Right. So that person's got to read up, well, what does Home Secretary do? And the aid is provided to them by the civil servants, whose job it is to run offices and, and inform ministers, you know, like, yes, minister, to inform them what they need to do. The problem is that where there once used to be a very powerful um, civil service, it's become less powerful because it's been watered down, down by what we call spads in the game, special advisors. And now you're tending to see that ministers have brought their own spads with them, special advisors with them, a la Cummings, and they listen to them more than they listen to the people who've been there doing the job all the time, the civil servants. So there's a mix of information they're getting. I've had ministers come up to me 
and say, oh, can you explain to me who are the officers and who are the men in terms of the police? I said, what do you mean, the officers and the men? So what, like the army? You know, you've got your officers who control things and you've got the men who just follow. So constables, example, are obviously men. Our sergeants, part of the men, are either, and, and then an inspector. Does, does an officer become as an inspector? I said, no. You're missing the point. The power of constable, and I guess I this, comes from the office of constable. So these are not men. If, if you want to put it in that context, they'd be officers because they're the ones who make the decisions. That's why they're actually called police officers because they're making officer decisions on the street. Right. Mm -hmm. Why is that important? That's important because you can't function like it's an army from top-down decisioning. Also, because of the way we function, we just send them out on the street. So we send the officer out onto the street and he or she sees what they see and they react to what they see. If they're uniform, they've got a uniform on, tall hat and shiny buttons, and they walk around the corner and something is in front of them, yeah, whatever the incident might be. They can't just turn around and take their hat off, their helmet off and, and, and walk away. No, they have to deal with it. So they deal with it as they see it at that time. And it's easy for others to second guess subsequently. Well, yeah, but also, I mean, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what is interesting. The, the, the other thing that, that strikes me about what um, the, you know, about what the Met Police Chief said today was that, you know, he's, he, he made a point in his in his statement to say that, you know, every burglary should be, you know, it should be stepped on and, uh, you know, and all the rest of it. But but to, to me, what I mean, playing on, uh, you know, obviously your, your listeners will know that you you've obviously been undercover and that you've worked on, you, you know, that you've got a you've got a an inner working understanding of uh, of, of terrorist organisations. Mm. And in a way those terrorist organisation crimes are, are are slightly more sort of, um, gosh, I can't even think of the word, but, but but like generic, I suppose, as opposed to, you know, what you're what you're what you're saying to me is that what your officer sees on the street and he has to make a decision on, like all the all of those crimes are actually very very different. I mean, even if you just look at the last Correct. week's worth of news, right? I mean, like look, the nine year old girl that got shot in Liverpool while her house was being burgled. I mean. You know, to be honest, it was obviously it was a huge tragedy, but essentially she was kind of collateral damage because the guy Correct. was just trying to rob her house, right? And then you've got like, the, but then if you look at the the 15 year old guy in Huddersfield that who was stabbed, I mean that was obviously a premeditated gang. Well, I mean I shouldn't say obviously, <laughs> in my opinion, it was a pretty, you know, it, it it was you know it was gang knife crime of which unfortunately we see too far too much of that on the streets, but but. You know, this is why I love you, Fergus. This is why I love you. Th th Absol th absolutely. OK, OK. Uh, this is a really long winded way of asking this question. Right. But I mean, my best friends grew up in Berlin. Mm -hmm. She's German. Right. And I said mm -hmm. to her once, hey, you know, when you learned about the Holocaust in history, right? Mm -hmm. what did the teacher say? Who did they say was to blame? And she said, 100 percent it was us she said it was like going to a therapy session she said you sat down and the teacher went it's all your fault mm -hmm. um when you sit down i mean I'm, I'm i'm being a bit flippant here but you know for crime 101 <laughs> like like i mean if we were th to think about the ideology of crime right why do people commit crimes and is there a difference between shooting that nine-year-old because you're trying to rob her house and uh you know a, and a teenager sticking a knife into no mouth. i know exactly where you're coming from i knew exactly what you meant this is why i said this is why i love you because the reality is this okay i can have no crime tomorrow if i make everything legal and i can have a mass of crimes the day after if i make everything illegal right so right there is the stupidity of saying we've got a crime wave and we've got to deal with the crime wave because it's what you perceive as crime. That's the first thing. So it's then also a factor of how you put those crimes in a table of importance. Okay. So if you say terrorism is the most important thing that we need to deal with, so we'll expend a lot of our policing time on terrorism. And by the way, don't be fooled. The police are the main body that combats terrorism. 
Okay. Yes, the secret intelligence services collate terrorist information. Yes, the services, especially the external service, MI6, of which I was an officer, they uh, prevent terrorism by going outside of the United Kingdom and gaining intelligence, as did the special branch and the security service do that. But the body who fights it on the ground, who you call to deal with it, is the police, right? All the time, and indeed in every country, to be fair. Right, so what you need to understand is, if they say terrorism is number one, where does burglary become? Where does stabbing somebody and killing them? And if I say to you, right, so we've got terrorism, but actually, when we look at the people who are killed by terrorism, it's only, let's say, 5% of those who are killed normally. Where, where should terrorism actually sit? Now, terrorism sits high because, of course, it's affecting the state and the whole premise is to undermine the state and the whole premise is to make everybody fearful in the state for whatever reason that might be. Um, so that's why it sits high. But you've and, it, and it's tied together, whereas your stabbings might be completely different stabbings from completely different people at completely different times for completely different reasons. Right. So 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 that's it. And of course, then there's the polemic of crime. Let's take crime against women. Just today on the Labour Party's uh, campaign, they basically said there is an epidemic of murder and violence against women. OK, I'm going to tell you now, the most person at threat to violence is a male between about 14 and 24. By far, mm. if you want to look at the deaths of people who get murdered, it's nine to one men. Mm. It's the guy who walks in a pub and somebody says, who are you looking at, mate? And the guy's got a choice now. Do you say I'm looking at you or do you just walk away? Does that walk away elicit the fact that when you turn your back, the fella jumps on you and smacks you in the head? Or do you stand up to him and then he pulls a knife and stabs you? Or puts a bottle in your face? Or puts a bottle on your throat because he's trying to hit your face, but he hits your throat, slices your throat, you die, murder. Right? So what I'm saying to you is that's how a lot of crimes, murders happen. So is it hyperbole to say that there's a, a, an endemic of crimes against women? Are women frightened? Of course they are. Are young men frightened? Of course they are. You know, if you also, I mean, also let's not forget, um, you know, um, transgender. Absolutely, everybody's a threat. I mean, that that that's that's that that's obviously huge, you know, Absolutely. and and never never fully represented by the media, which is you know shocking, really. I, I, absolutely, but you can. But what I'm saying is, you can do this for every case. So what I'm saying to you is, is it's where we actually, as a society, stick the, um, what should I call it? Uh, put the line, place the line as to what we think is good or what we think is bad or what we think is getting out of hand or what isn't getting out of hand. So that's why I explained the thing about you turning the corner and you seeing something as a uniform constable. Now, when you hear a oh, commissioner on, turn around and say... I'm going to stop you for, for one second, though. Right, right. OK, so so, so where does it all go wrong, right? Because, like, OK, if you if you were, um, you know, like, like me, uh, uh, like an English student and you were reading, uh, you know... Cl classic historic novels or or even if you just watch Bridgerton or something right mm -hmm. you know back in the old days chaps sorted it out on the street with a jewel and you know they had a pistol and they had a foil or something right mm -hmm. and it was all you know fisticuffs but you know well, stabbings they, they, they slashed each other with knives with swords when did, when shot each other the, like like how did it get from the point where every gentleman sort of you know carried a pistol for for you know you know where where, where 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 you know a chap had a pistol to the point where people are throwing acid in each other's faces because because Very their good. football team lost right an american once said an armed society is a polite society now i don't know if that's true but what i do know is uh, and I'm not for people having arms, by the way. Um, what uh, I'm for the police having arms, but I'm not for people having arms. Um, what I do know is, is that probably if everybody carried a, a, a weapon, you would assume that people would think anything that happens can get out of hand, which is what happens in the United States. 
the worst example of people carrying arms in the world, I think. Everybody carrying a weapon crazily and people getting killed the way they shouldn't. So it doesn't make an armed society a polite society. It, to me, it makes an armed society a dangerous society. But what I'm saying is those fellows going back in time who all carried a sword or a sword stick later on or um, a pistol when they were available because everybody had a right to a pistol. It's just that most people couldn't afford it. Um, when you had all that, that they knew that any defensive action could lead to the death of somebody. Mm. So for some people, that might be, oh, I won't do it. But for others, it might be, I will do it. Yeah. So it, it, it's you're dealing with people here, so you don't know. The reason I was going to say about the burglary, though, if the commission is saying every burglary should be looked at, where is he getting his, 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 his person power from? Where is he getting his men and women from? You know, mm. there was when I joined, there was 32,000 police officers in the Metropolitan Police. I'd be surprised if that's now 25. Mm. Literally, if that's 25,000. Wow. I'd be surprised. Wow. And, and, and by far, what you've got to understand, the Met is the biggest force in the United Kingdom by far. The next biggest force down, you've got to go to probably Police Scotland now. Police Scotland's probably about 10,000 people, something like that. Uh, then maybe Great Manchester's the same. So... The Mets is massively different than anything else. Um, so what I'm saying is, is that it's okay to say we're going to investigate every burglary. Now, this is the other factor. Mm. When you make everything a crime, which a lot of things are crimes now, which were never crimes before, right? Rightly or wrongly, I'm not. I'm making no assessment as well, to no, whether also, they should I mean, be like, crimes. But, but but you're right because there are new crimes that come along every day. I mean, like I mean, when you back when you were in the in in the Met, hacking wasn't really a crime. Correct. You know, um, you, you know, Bitcoin exploitation wasn't wasn't a crime. You know, like I mean, even like you know, hacking the stock exchange or or uh, you know, I mean, internet crime essentially wasn't. Fergus, something more simple than that. When I joined in 1984, and as I said, I'm not going to argue that I was doing things on the street. I was two years on the street. So let's make that clear. And then I went into secret intelligence. But when I joined in 1984, a man, husband, could not rape his wife. Right. Right. OK, so that's that's that. Now, you could assault her. You could do a whole lot of things around it, but you couldn't rape wow. her because it was perceived that there was conjugal rights. Gosh. Right. So the law has changed. So this is what I'm saying to you, right? Also, hold on. You said 1984. So, so hang on a minute. Like the Criminal Justice Act was 1988, wasn't it? There's there's, there's, there's loads of acts that you don't ever hear of that change so, the laws. So, so, so that so, change the laws. So, loads of them. Loads of so, them. Every, in all, my, all in the my time. mind, that's when all those. That's when it. When it, is is that not when all those you know personal weapons were banned? You know, like. No, 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 no. I mean, the biggest change that we've had is the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, which of 1986. That's the biggest change we had. It changed how policing policed, because up until then, a police officer could arrest you, put you in a cell. Right. You had no right to see a lawyer. Mm. Right. He could question you forever and a day. You had no right to a recording. They took what was called contemporaneous notes. So you were supposedly saying something to them and they were writing down the notes. But hey, that's open to massive abuse. Um, you, you didn't have any rights as to what you could do or you couldn't do. Obviously, there's a right of habeas corpus, a right not to be arrested for no reason. But you're going to have to prove that and you're going to have to get yourself a lawyer. Right. Now, of course, you have an absolute right to a lawyer. You have an absolute right to say nothing. You have an absolute right to say no comment. You have an absolute right to see the, the, the uh, to see pace the police and criminal evidence act and know what your rights are. You have an absolute right to see that now. They can only hold you for X amount of time, right? You know, yeah. otherwise you need extensions, right? To hold you, you have to go in front of a magistrate to get extensions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that changed. And then they created the, the Crown Prosecution Service at the same time to come in and deal with that issue, to, to take away the charging. Because when I was first there, you had a thing called a court presentation officer, which was generally a police constable who, for the smaller offences, things like burglary sometimes, but definitely uh, um, general assaults, definitely criminal damage, uh, um, stuff like that. That was taken to court by a police officer. A police officer stood up in front of the of, of the magistrate and gave all the evidence. And actually, they were very good at it. 
It was generally an officer who'd been in for having a day. They knew what came down on 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 that particular day. It wasn't like some CPS guy running up who had 100 cases thinking, well, what was this one about and what's that about? They knew the law, they knew how it functioned, they knew how the officer probably arrested him. And so they just give the evidence as, as a lawyer does today. So they acted like a lawyer. Mm. Right? That was a police constable, a PC doing that. Yeah. That's how that functioned in the old days. But, right? okay. Yeah, go on. So completely different. So what's happened is when that changed, a lot of different elements came in for the changing of the laws came in. Now you've got mobile phones. You imagine when I was first there, no mobile phones. I can remember seeing a woman in, I'm walking up Victoria Street and I saw a woman being accosted by her, turned out to be a boyfriend or was it her husband, one of the two. And he was basically pulling her hair out. I can remember, I can remember seeing it. So I said to, and I'm meant to be a probationer, and I'd been a detective for the Americans before, so I understood how the law was functioning and, and how you did it. So I wasn't, I was a probationer in, in, in the Met, but I'd done some, well, for five years, I'd been doing investigative work before. So for the American, so I said, listen, hey, we've got to stop this. And this PC said to me, ah, it, it's, it's, it's a domestic, I can see. I said, what's that got to do with it? This fellow's beating her up here in the street. What's he going to do with her when he's not in the street? So I went in, got them aside, boom, boom, boom. You're going to be under arrest, my friend, for an assault. And uh, she said, all right. And next minute, the woman started fighting me. Right? So I said, you know, stop, 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 stop. Oh, what are you doing with him? I said, well, he's been beating you up. He, oh, well, uh, he's not. I said, no, he is. I saw it. He's beating you up. So anyway, took him into the van, got arrested, took him into the station. Before pace, he was he was going to be charged. Great, super duper. Went to the woman, said, can I take photographs of where he's pulled your hair out? No, he's not here. We can get him away from you. It'll be okay. She said, yeah, yeah, great. Blah, 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 blah. So I started doing that. I did the case. And this, other, this old sweat, he, was, he had 20 odd years in 30, 20 odd years in the job. He said, well, I told you it was a domestic. I said, yeah, but mate, we're not having that. That can't be done. So sorted this out got all the evidence, put it up in front of the court, went to the court, she didn't turn up. Mm. So I said to the judge, judge, can I have time? Judge says, well, you need to get your, your, your client here. I said, okay, can I have time? Uh, okay, we'll adjourn this till, I think it was till three days' time or whatever it was. So I, you know, went to her. I'm a PC. You know, I ain't got real time to do that as a PC because you're meant to be patrolling. But anyway, I went to her place. I said, listen, why have you not turned up? Oh, as I told you at the time, it was just a bit of a dispute, you know. I said, well, why do you let me take photographs and everything like that? I said, this is not the first time, is it? She said, no, well, I love him, blah, blah, blah. You know? And she just wouldn't give evidence. Gosh. Okay. So what I'm saying to you is sometimes it was absolutely right what, my, what I did. Absolutely right. And I think the old-fashioned PC was wrong. But what I am saying is, is that, Nothing is ever straightforward. And we make assumptions that all these cases are dead straightforward. Now, the reason why I brought that up as well and, is and also, today, I mean, you know, 70 I mean, people like, would have been on the mobile phones calling up saying, listen, in the streets, a man beating a woman up. Yeah. Yeah. And someone would have posted it on social media and all the rest Into of it. But, but, exactly. But, 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 but then. Can, depending on what, you know, depending on what the background and the, you know, the social political, you know, um, situation of that couple would have been that that woman might still not have spoken out because she's in fear you know, she might have been terrified that Correct. she was going to lose her kids or she was going to lose her home or you know Correct. because there is no there's, there's no system to protect well she had no kids but what it was i feared that she was fearful of losing her home you know, now, whether it was her home or not, I, I can't remember for the top of my head. It may well have been her home who actually she had the rights and he didn't. But what I'm saying is now there'll be effort will be put into that case quite rightly. There will be, you know, 20, 30 people who would have made the call anyway, if an officer wasn't there to say, hey, listen, this is what's happening. So now you've got police rushing to that particular crime. Yeah. Mm. Whereas before you wouldn't. So, so wh what I'm saying is, is for you to say we'll investigate every crime takes no account of the fact that 10 people might call that crime at the same time as they call 15 other crimes. Right. Because now there's mobile phones, because now there's actions happening everywhere. And now police yeah, are turning up actually, everywhere. 
It's um okay. Like I, I want to talk about. I want to move on to talk about knife crime in a minute, and I sure. want to talk about the cost of living. But just on the social media point, um, it is what what people probably don't know, um, is that them posting on something about crime on social media can actually do more harm than good, can't it? Because because actually technically you're um, it, it, you know technically you're sort of prejudicing the. The, you can be the reflection of it and you... and the uh, i mean um I, I read something and, and obviously you're the expert which is why it's such an honor to be able to ask this to, to the no, i don't say an honor please come on oh, well no i mean it's great because i get to uh, get to find out the actual truth but um that gosh that there was um there was a case about two two girls who who sort of said who, who'd who'd alleged that they were raped by a footballer and they'd outed it on social media and it, it didn't go to court because, well, it took a long time to go to court because they'd essentially got, mm, so they, they, the, the social media, um, that, that, that they, it's prejudiced to the case. Is what you're prejudiced the case, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So, 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 um, but, 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 but technically, Okay. Okay. So you tell me how it is. Like, you know, if I were, if somebody, if somebody burgled my house at, you know, like heaven forbid, and I, you know, took pictures and I shared them on the internet, does that? No, no, I don't think it's prejudicial at all. I mean, that, that's evidential, I would suggest. Um, I can see the difference in the rape case where somebody might suggest it's prejudicial. If, that's not showing any evidence. I mean, I mean of that. you know, I mean, is it? Were they showing evidence it, of the it, rape? People said it was defamation because it were because I think in this case it was going to court anyway. But and, I think what uh, they were saying was that they were um, they would sway the jury mm -hmm. because they'd already got I'd agreed because he's a well-known person or whomever that person is, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That I can understand. But you see, again, you could argue that for any case, I suppose. But where people are known, then it can be because people, the people coming into the court will have seen it. But if it's just Joe Soap, the vast majority of people walking into a court will not have seen what's what's happened. So they won't know. And and I'm and I'm imagining that the two young women didn't take a picture of the actual offence. They just took a pictures of something around it. So that's not evidential of the offence. You know, you can say you've been raped. And by the way, men can be raped, like women can be raped or whatever. You can say you've been raped, but if you're giving evidence of it, if that were evidential, it would be actually in the act of that and what was all going through. And again, where does the tape begin and where does the tape end? You see, we've got a big problem now, I think. I think people watch television. I think people see CSI. And I think people say, well, if this and that happened, where is the forensics? Mm. Right, because they see this CSI stuff because it made up, and then they think, well, actually, normally they've got this or they've got that or they've got you know uh, DNA or they've got whatever. Well, and that can work both ways because you can say, oh, this man's DNA was found on whatever. Well, that DNA might have been there for ten years. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, it doesn't mean to say a fellow's guilty just because you've got a fellow's DNA. It could be there forever in a day. He could have been there 30 years ago and his DNA is on. It means zero. It's the same way, you know, don't get me wrong, police use this and prosecutors use this to try and try their case. So it will say, all right, well, when he went down the road, he drove past that uh, uh, um, uh, uh, particular um, tower which said he was in that area and then he drove a little bit further on and the tower said he was in that area and then he drove further on the tower said he was that area and the crime was committed and his phone and he was there no you mean his phone was there mm. right? don't say he was there his phone's there his phone could be there for any type of reason going on or even to some extent i'm not so sure now these days because it may have changed but in one day you could have had his isme and actually had that registering when it's actually not him because it's been cloned yes yeah? there's yes. a whole host of things that can happen now our problem is in our system is you are wealthy you get a great lawyer all those things are looked at you're not wealthy with a basic lawyer and, you know, 
not as much work is going to be done to defend your perspective. So again, you see, it's all a question of what the circumstances are. Yeah. And let's be realistic about it. If you were going to say to somebody, you can only find this person guilty if it's beyond all reasonable doubt. Just think about that, Fergus. Fergus, mm -hmm. think about it. Beyond, not at, beyond all reasonable doubt. Well, it's a, that's in a ver that's a very very um, pertinent point that you bring up because I started out my PR career in uh, the music industry, mm -hmm. and back in the old days, right, record label contracts used to have a clause in there that basically said, I mean, essentially the gist of it is we own your rights for any format that is ever invented, right? But it was hilarious because the wording of the contracts basically said any format that currently exists or hasn't been invented or might be invented in the future or could be invented by aliens <laughs> is invented on another planet or exists in another universe i mean literally it, honestly you would piss yourself laughing because that's basically what it says but beyond all reasonable doubt actually like you know it, I, I mean I, I, again i know I'm, I'm i'm being a bit flippant but you're presuming that you, you know that the, the world gets bigger and like what what does reasonable doubt mean exactly if there, if there is a not you know if if you know if if you know if monkeys learn to read what does reasonable doubt <laughs> absolutely mean if aliens land from mars what does reasonable doubt mean you know if if um the neurodiverse take over the world what does reasonable doubt mean if um <laughs> if we're you know taking into account the 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 opinions of unborn children or or whatever i mean you know like we could we do you know what i mean uh, like i know i'm being flippant and and but you're not I, you're I not you're actually head. saying something but, that you're actually saying something fergus that is pertinent because at the end of the day i mean does, does, does reasonable doubt take into consideration um you know nomadic tribes does it take into consideration you know um the, 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 like refugees who who are terrified does it take into consideration people who you know d d don't don't even speak a language that 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 is a you know that's a recorded language um there's you know reasonable doubt is such a big um sweeping statement isn't it if we were to look at look at it like that if we were to analyze it like that okay carson as a wordsmith as someone you know as someone who writes for a living okay beyond all reasonable doubt if you take those two words reasonable and doubt Okay, they're very strong words, you know, they're very ambiguous words, right? And then when you add beyond to that, you know, you, you've actually, you've, you've, got, you've got something that doesn't really make sense. Correct, correct. Pull it apart, you know, let I, alone use that as, uh, as, as, you know, how, as your defence. Well, that is it, you see. Basically, in our system, in a criminal court, you cannot find a jury cannot find somebody guilty if they don't find them guilty beyond all reasonable doubt. So your belief must be that this person has committed that offence for which he stands in front of a judge and for which you as the jury are making the decisions on it and that it is beyond all reasonable doubt. So what I'm saying to you is that is a massively powerful set of words to prove. So let's take the one thing that people are speaking most about, which is about the issue of rapes, uh, women being found, or should I say, people, men generally, but it, I guess it could be man on man or whatever, but men being found guilty of rape, generally against women, they say in front of a court that the conviction rate is very low. But if you put that beyond all reasonable doubt to the jury, because you've got to remember the jury's making the decision. The police aren't making that decision. The court, the jury's making that decision. So beyond all reasonable doubt, and then it's he said, she said. I tell you, it's very difficult. Mm, it is, it is. Uh, I mean, yeah, it, it is. And, and, and maybe your listeners want to 
contribute to, to this conversation. Yeah, I'd love, well, to, I'd love to hear that, what <laughs> listeners think. It'd be fantastic. You're absolutely right. What do listeners, what do listeners think about that? Because, and this is what's interesting, when we talk about civil cases, which nine times out of ten relate to money, then what they say is the guilty level is within the balance of probabilities in civil cases. Mm. So that's much easier to prove, in the balance of probabilities. So, yeah, it's more probable that he did than he didn't. Easy, right? Beyond all reasonable doubt, that's that's right there. Beyond all reasonable doubt. Think about it. Beyond that. Not just reasonable, beyond it. Well, I'm going to say to all your listeners, please comment on this because we'd love to know what, what you think. Um, anyway, I'm going to just segue slightly because I really... Please do. I want to talk about knife crime, right? Yes. Um, I, I, it's, a personal, it's a personal issue for me because I moved out of London coming up to four years ago now. I live in Norfolk, right? I moved out of East London, but where I lived in East London was a place called Forest Gate. And it, I think it's like the London's highest crime spot for for the knife crime right mm -hmm. you know it got to the point where not only were the police coming into the secondary schools to tell the kids about knives and about knife amnesties and not only were they coming into the primary schools and then they started coming into the play groups mm -hmm. you know and um you know there there, there were all the the amnesty bins everywhere and the you know uh, 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 and all the rest of it but you know it, it's it's that thing like you know so, so, so we so we made the move we moved out of London because because it was just it was getting oppressive I mean we had a neighbour who who had to strip her bed sheets and you know that there, there was a there was a chap who was lying bleeding on her doorstep and and his neck had been slit and she had to take, take the sheets off her bed and wrap, wrap it around his neck to, and while she was calling the ambulance and super action but anyway um. I, I find I find knife crime interesting. Not that makes me sound really morbid, but um, no, it, no, it does. But going back to what you were saying about um, men and homicide, right? Mm -hmm. The the highest death toll in London mm -hmm. from knife crime was reported in like actually in 2021. So during like essentially like you know just out of the pandemic. Sure like the, the, which a sort of strikes me as slightly strange b b like when you go back to the getting inside the head of a criminal mm -hmm. right now we we've obviously got this whole huge cost of living crisis and you know and i imagine that that there are probably going to be many people who who through desperation and poverty shoplift or burgle or mm -hmm. you know do things to make ends meet but 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 to me that's a different level of crime to sticking a knife in someone's neck or and is it buying, and buying a knife or is and, it and all the rest of it but but is it but is it i mean you know in police uh, like i know i'm joking about police 101 but but you know in police 101 is it a different crime I, and also also i mean the media would say if, if you look at the media they would say the reason why teenagers do this is because they're all watching video games and it's all about stabbing and la 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 and then they all find a gang that they can identify with and then suddenly you know they get a knife and da 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 but it, but it's not it's not as it's not as simplistic as that no but what, what, what i would no. say is sorry are you, sorry go on carry on no 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 you talk. Right. You talk what i would say is is it's not simplistic at all Right. For many, 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 many years, the number one knife crime area in Europe was Glasgow. And for many, many, many years, it was the number one murder capital of Europe, particularly when it came to knives. OK, now. The point and the reason why I bring that up is they weren't looking at videos. They weren't looking at rap music. They weren't looking at whatever. What it was, was a culture up in that particular area of Scotland, Scotland, of uh, um, men carrying knives. Apologies to all your Scottish. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I thought it was good. And by the way, I believe I've got some Scots-Irish heritage. So I think I can say a little bit of Scott. 
Well, anyway. Oh, so, you know, my husband's Scottish, but but but, I, I think, <laughs> but Carlton, I think your Scottish accent is probably better than his because no. he lived London, he's lived down south for twenty five years. That doesn't say much for him. So but yeah, but no. So that he'll tell you if he knows him from if he's from Scotland and and let's say he's anywhere near the central belt, you know. Glasgow was pretty much knife capital, as I said, and it was a fact. Now, the way they dealt with it was, it was a chief superintendent, a female chief superintendent, no, a female chief inspector and a male chief superintendent, I think it was, who got together and they said, you know what, we need to deal with this in a different way. We need to deal with it as a mental health problem, one. We need to deal with it as a problem of fear, too. And we need to deal with it as a policing problem in terms of hard policing and the way it functions, three. And there was something else they put together. I can't remember what it was. The four drugs, maybe? Drugs. Well, yeah, I mean, drugs is an element. but it's and, and as you know, up in Glasgow, there's loads of drugs not in there and all the rest of it. But that's not only the element, because there's drugs in many places and they're not necessarily stabbing each other in the same way. So there's other elements to it. So this is why I'm saying I actually think everything plays into it. I actually think when you look at these sort of issues and you look at them in different places, I think a lot of different things play into it. One, yes, drugs, drink. I mean, in Scotland, drink is a big factor. Yeah, It's it's not being perceived as a coward to back down. You know, It's uh, fear because you find that somebody else can give you a good hiding. And to level up the game, what I do is I carry a knife because I level myself up now. Now I can probably do something. Whereas this big geezer is going to beat me up if I haven't. Then you can say um, there's money involved in it, especially if you're running drugs and whatever else uh, that may be. Um, Then there's uh, um, kudos in it. Then there's the fact that you do have these video games and you might be desensitized to to what's going on. I think there's a plethora of reasons. I don't think you can just aim it on one, you know, that there's no youth clubs anymore, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because, after, because let's be realistic, the reason why they brought in a ban on flick knives and stuff like that was because in the 1950s, teddy boys were going around stabbing everybody, right? Mm. So it, it, it's not new. This thing's been going on forever and a day, so it is not new. So it, what I'm saying is it's... It's how it's perceived in the modern world, oftentimes without the context. You know, when I was... Sorry. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. So so going back to the teddy boy stabbings, okay, Mm -hmm. Um, and going back to the, like, reactive drink, Mm -hmm. you know, induced stabbing and all the rest of it. If you were... Okay, I can't even believe I'm having this conversation, but but if only with you, only with you, Carlton, right? If you were going to murder someone, right... Like you've got to, if you're going to stab them, you've got to get it in the right place. Mm-hmm. Because otherwise, it's otherwise you you won't kill them, and then and then you're the one that's going to go to prison because they're still alive and they're injured. And, well, well, I mean, either way, we you go to prison if you get caught. But do you know what I mean? It's like if you're not I do know what you mean. But the problem is with stabbing is it's not precise, and sometimes you can stab somebody just by pinpricking them, and what you think is a pinprick. But actually, they bleed internally. You could stab them and hit any of the arteries, and next minute they bleed out in seconds. You can stab them and um, and cause them to be a paraplegic. You, you know, there's a whole lot of things that might happen. It's it's not a given that you won't die, and it's not a given that you will die. You know, it's all about who gets to. Like that lady you spoke about, fantastic job she did. Obviously, ripping up her sheets and and putting a tourniquet on and and supporting that individual. But, 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 who, but all I'm saying is, whoever like. Like, you know, the perpetrator of, of, of that crime, the mm-hmm. perpetrator of that crime slit that person's neck. Yes. I that's would say that's purposeful. Big, that's a big I thing. I would say that's purposeful. To, that's a big thing to do as opposed to just, you know, being a little bit drunk and like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, being like that. Um, I would say that's purposeful. I would say they went out purposefully to but, but, but kill But I would person. say, I would go even further, and I would say they, that, you know what I mean, somebody told them what to do. What? Uh, did they? Ah, what you mean is, you mean tactically, you mean, how to, how to kill yeah. somebody, you mean. Right, OK. Well, one of the biggest things that I fear, I used to be a Kung Fu man, as you know, oh. um, but I fear a knife probably in many ways more than a gun. Because you get some people who learn to use a knife well, and they're absolutely deadly. 
Okay, because there's a thing called Krav Maga, which is a, an Israeli fighting art. Oh, I'm um, aware of it, yes. You're aware of it, right. So what they are doing... With, I don't in, do it because I'm, I've had four kids and I'm not that fit. <laughs> right. But you know what they're doing in that art when they're using knife techniques? And don't get me wrong, it's in other techniques as well as a Kung Fu Q doorman where you can use knives and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, you know what, Carlton? There's a big thing at the moment. There's a big thing about girls sort of upskilling themselves in Krav Maga. Yeah, right, you? okay. Then you get a dangerous situation, don't you? Because what are they going to do? Are they going to use a knife? Because in Krav Maga, there's one element where you come and you slit the fellow at the throat, right? Mm. You slit him all the way down his body, okay? At an angle, at an angle, comes down at an angle, so from one shoulder down to the pelvis, yeah? And then you slit them across at the bottom of their arteries, of their legs, because you want to kill them. So no matter what happens, if there's a doctor right there and, an, and a hospital right there and they're actually sitting you on the trolley, you will not survive that. But 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 this So what I'm saying is that's teaching to, people though, to kill people part, for sure. This comes down to what we were saying about beyond all reasonable doubt, right? And what we were saying about rape cases, right? Mm. So beyond all reasonable doubt, okay, what if, right, the guy was the, the, you know, the, the 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 guy was raping the woman on the street. She mm -hmm. does that move on them, and mm -hmm. then they're dead. Well, who? What? Where's reasonable doubt? <laughs> right now, this is the question. Now, the, now you're looking at the uh, um, criminal law Act section three. What it says is to prevent a crime. Right, you can use reasonable force. So the question is, what is deemed as reasonable force? Oh, there's two more words that are... Exactly. <laughs> this is the thing with the law. This is it. It's all about reason reasonableness. What is reasonable? Let me tell you an actual story very quickly, because I know we've got timing problems. Right. So back in 1982, before the Grapes of Wrath campaign, where the Israelis went in to push out the PLO out of Lebanon, right? Back in that, what happened is the reason why that whole thing happened and thousands of people died subsequent to that uh, was that in London, the Israeli ambassador who was protected by the special branch, one of the guys was protected. And in those days, he did single man protections. Never liked it. I thought it was nonsense. But anyway, single protection officer with him. Now, he did set in place systems. So he had outside uniform officer from the DPG, Deployment Protection Group, carrying a firearm. And he had a, a couple of uniformed constables around. And it was in the Dorchester. And it was a big event. And people were coming out of the Dorchester. And they're all walking out. Now, the Abu Nidal terrorist who was there, who was sent to assassinate the Israeli ambassador, was waiting for him outside. And he just looks like a normal guy standing there. And as the ambassador comes out and he walks out of the Dorchester, you know, it's all bright lights in the Dorch. And you step out and you come out and the, the SP officer's with the ambassador. And they step out. And next minute, boom, 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 three rounds go from a Scorpion machine pistol. Hits the ambassador, bang, he goes down, right? So the SP officer pulls his, what we had in those days was a Model 64 pea shooter, Smith & Wesson. He pulls that weapon, yeah, to look at the guy, but the guy had already actually turned his weapon on the SP officer because he knew he must have that, and it fired, right? But it didn't go off. The weapon jammed for whatever reason. So the guy run, starts running off, as he's ratcheting the weapon to try and clear it so he can shoot again. So the SP officer very quickly says to the DPG guy, get an ambulance, make sure nobody gets to, there's nobody else lurking around, look around, I'm going after this fella because he's a danger to the public, I'm going after him. So he runs, he runs after this other fella, who's now still trying to ratchet his weapon and get it right. And the fella turns, the terrorist turns, to try and shoot the SP officer, but half turns as such, and the SP officer puts one shot in him and brings him down, right? So he falls down to the ground. Now, you, what would you say there? Well, I would say, uh, having because I know you, I would say two things, that that officer has to be accountable for what he's just done. Correct. But also, he, he did what he thought was right. Yeah. See, you'd think, I would think, that most people say, tea and medals, fantastic job, mate. You've got the way a fellow who's running away who's still a danger he's got a machine gun with him anybody could be there blah 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 blah. no what happens is he gets put on trial at the old bailey and he's got to defend his position because they turn around and say well what threat was he he's running away from you okay so what i'm saying to you is this is the I'm law. running away with a with a live weapon <laughs> absolutely but the people <laughs> saying this of course are people who've never seen an angry man in their life 
<laughs> and, and, right. and, you know, when you talk about tea and medals, that's like, the, the, you know, the people in the old Bailey that has just sat there, like, you know, <laughs> you know, anyway, yeah, no, no, I, I hear what you're saying. This is I, what the law's like, you what... see, this is what it's like, because, so, you know. So, so, so I know, so what do you think that the solution, what, what do you think, I, I mean, I, I know that, the media has has played a mass uh, has played what they think is a massive part whether whether it's a massive part or not i don't know but 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 the media has is very vocal about all these kind of you know knife amnesties and uh, and sort of outing knife crime and trying to take a responsible role in it almost a sort of you know tub but it is fergus sorry i've got to say this i've got to say this i've got to say this fergus it is but it isn't so what you get is the police stop a, a, a girl with three guys and they search the girl because they know the guys hand their weapons to a girl when they see the police. Yeah. And they search the guys and then they search the girl. But then they say, oh, heavy handed policing, searching everybody. So where do they sit? Where, where do the police sit? What, but, but, what yeah, can but they also, do? But also, but, also what's the, but also what's the solution, right? Why, you know, you've been undercover with terrorist organizations yes. you know you know you know what's going through those 15 year olds heads when they're buying knives on the internet yeah but this is a, this is more of a general policing problem rather than a uh, a national security or secret intelligence okay. or, all right, or all right, so all right. so so what i'm saying so it doesn't equate to that but what i'm saying is i understand that you're absolutely right so we're looking into their minds because of course why would they do it? Why would they? Also, I mean, Carlton, right? Okay, so so funny story, like that might make you laugh. I think, like my brother, my brother's a chef, right? And yep. back in, God, it was nineteen ninety nine, two thousand, right? He he was putting himself through chef school, right? Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't want to go to university. He wanted to put himself through chef school. He wanted to be a chef, like blah blah blah. Um, he had no money. Like, I mean, he was basically funding himself doing chef school by road sweeping at night, and and, and he got a job. Uh, he got an, uh, an apprenticeship in a restaurant in the Square Mile. And so we lived in North London at the time. And he, so he was cycling to work at, at, at about three in the morning right, to do that night shift because that, after he's finished sweeping the streets. Right. And if you when you're when you're training to be a chef, you basically have to get yourself. A, you have to buy yourself a set of chef's knives mm -hmm. right? and they come in like a briefcase. Mm hmm. And my brother used to say, right, because he used to cycle, right, so so he don't even know what knives he'd need for his work, that, you know, and he'd put them in his backpack and he'd wrap them up in a T-shirt and he'd put them in his thing. Right? And he'd say, basically, it was 50-50, it was right? Like, if he kept them in, if he kept them in the briefcase that they came in, and he took them to work in the briefcase they came in, going to work at, in the square mile at three in the morning, he'd get, he'd get mugged. Right. <laughs> right? <laughs> If he cycled with them wrapped up in his backpack in a T-shirt, you get stopped by old Bill. Yeah. <laughs> so it was like you can't win, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. This, this is obviously he'd he'd hopefully have a reasonable reason to have it with him, and therefore, but then why the police may or may not be leaving? This is the problem. So the, we we come back to what we really started with. We come back to, to reasonableness and we come back to the commissioner's proclamation, a proclamation that, frankly, in many ways, doesn't stand up. You know, he's got a force of 25,000, whatever, plus civvies, plus, plus uh, police uh, community support officers uh, who are not police officers, but add support, so don't have the same powers of arrest, or don't have powers of arrest, full stop, to be fair, other than the citizens' powers of arrest. So what you've, what you've got is you've got, you know, altogether in the Met, 50-odd thousand people, but not all of them by any means are police officers. So you, he's got this. I asked the question of this commissioner from his statement is, how are you going to solve every burglary? Because I don't think you are. I just don't think you've got the manpower. How, on top of the burglary, you've got people calling you up for everything you can think about, you know, and then you've got the one calling you up that says, I want a taxi home, can you help me? So, you know, and you find them all calling in for whatever reasons you've got, and they've got to prioritise where they go to. It's like the ambulance service, isn't it? What's that? I mean, what's, what's, like, what's the maximum sentence for burglary? Like, what, four years or something? It depends. Burglary I mean, depends. It depends well, what judges okay. are, going to, are, are, are going to give them. But, um, you know, the maximum sentence... But, but, but just, just bog-standard, you know, breaking... Well, it, could be, it, it can be 10 years. 
Oh, really? Okay. You know, it just depends on what it is. You know, I mean, because what happens is, is it depends what kind of. See, if there's, there's a nine, it is technical, because you know, as an SP officer, you have to do the CID course, so you understand the basis of of, of that. So there's a nine one A burglary, and there's a nine one B burglary, right? So it depends. So if you rape any woman therein, right, that's a burglary. Right. Burglary basically means you're going in somewhere where you are, where you have not been granted authorities to do so, and and you can steal therein. You can do a whole lot of things within there, and it can be a burglary. You see what I mean? So, oh, that's so it just depends. It just depends on what what that what that is. So, what, what, I would say, all I would say is that you know, given the situation that Britain is in right now with the cost of living, mm -hmm. you know, we're all heading into winter. We're all heading into that you know, eating or heating situation, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, you, you know, circumspect person might say, well, probably those sorts of crimes are going to, um, that, that we'll see an uptick in those. I think you're right. In the, in those kinds of, kind of crimes, right. but, 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 um, but, but for survival. Well, What's one person's survival? One person's survival is another person's. I'm not. I'm not justifying it. All no, no, I'm not, I'm not saying you are. I'm, I'm not saying, saying you are. You know, I, I, like, like, like. I mean, you know, you, when, like, like, if, if a, you, you know, let's. All I'm saying is that that I, I, pre, I, I would speculate that there will be cases where your, um, you, you know, where, where, where the officer that has to make that decision is having to make a decision about whether ethically that person was just trying to feed their family. Right. Let me stop you right there. Or, or whether, you know. Let me stop you right there. This is the other factor which we haven't even spoke about. Right now you've got a body-born camera on you, okay, for uniformed officers, body-born camera, so they can see what's going on, yeah? And they're meant to turn it on when there's any incident, and I think they're talking about just having them on you know, the system can turn them on. Right, so a body-born camera. The days of discretion are gone. That person's committed a crime. They've stolen meat. Yeah. The officer can't take that person around the corner and say, listen, mate, you've stolen some meat. Don't do that again. We'll give the meat back to the store. Store, you happy he's giving you the meat back? Yes, he's giving you the meat back. Mate, don't do it again on your bike. No, an offence is taking place now. So now because you've got a body born camera, how are you going to release that person? Because they may turn around and say, you released him from doing it from that store and he went next door and stole something else. But but then ethically, um if 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 that camera is on all the time and uh, go filming people who aren't committing crimes. That's why they're meant to switch it on when there is an, an event. But the point I'm saying is, is this: but, 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 it doesn't but, give the officer if any. They're allowed to take, have it on the whole time, you know. That's the same as GDPR or something, isn't it? I mean, like. But it's not good. It, 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 absolutely. But what I'm saying is, you know, in the you know in the old days when your parents would have said to you, "Oh, police officer came and slapped me because I said, said don't do it," and I went on my way, right? Yeah. Now, what's nine times out of ten going to happen? That. He's all official. There's no slapping your head because that's an assault. So he's not going to do that because you know the law and you'll complain about it. And the parents, unlike in the old days, where the parents would say, what the police hit you across the head for? Because, oh, right, I'm going to give you one as well, are gone. So they're going to take that into a legal manner and they're going to do it all the way through legal. So a small event now becomes a big event. So these fellows are now on the street. These were men and women are now on the street policing. They're out. They're in the office dealing with a small event because now everything's got to be done legally and correctly and properly and through the system. And your discretion's gone. So it increases the workload. Now don't get me wrong. I can see why you have cameras, but it's increasing the workload. And 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 the whole thing about give, putting it in the hands of officers to make decisions. Is gone. They're now becoming more and more, although they have these powers and they're the ones who can see this and they're the ones who can do these things, when you don't do them, when you don't arrest that person when an obvious offence has been committed, what's your reasoning for that? Why didn't you? But also, but also I mean, that bit begs the whole bigger question about what's done with the footage that they just, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, Carlton, you know I worked on the Leveson inquiry, right? Absolutely. And, and you know... I, I, you know, I personally feel like a lot of the, 
you, you know, the, the media was held to task for information that they collected that they shouldn't have collected. Correct. Well, I don't think it was even held to task, me. This is where you and I differ a slight bit, because I don't think you were held to task at all. Well, well OK. The, the, <laughs> the media was outed for the fact that they outed. collected That's information yes. that they shouldn't have collected, right? Yeah. Yeah. To, to flip that over, if officers on the street have roaming cameras, they are yeah. collecting information that they don't need to have. Well, those can right until they need them so now as a general rule well until they need them but 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 but, 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 but i didn't put the cameras in place the public supposedly they wanted the cameras the public supposedly wanted the cameras you know the public wanted police accountable and so the way to make them accountable was to give them cameras so that when anything happens you put it on and then people can see what's happened they're only getting it from the perspective of when the police officer turned the camera on. So then people argue, well, maybe you should have the camera on all the time because they're going to turn it on when it's beneficial to them. And they could have done something beforehand or they could have done something out. You know, this is what you get. And, of course, we are, the, with the exception of China now, we are the most filmed nation in the whole world. I know, it's mad, isn't it? Like, even my, um, my sat-nav now tells me when there's a speed camera. Correct. <laughs> So everything's filmed. Everything's so, 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 so I'm sure in in a couple of years' time, my sat nav will be telling me when there's a police officer that's <laughs> yeah. But you, your cameras are all over the place, aren't they? You, when you're driving down the road, that number that that your number plate's been taken and it's been measured against the, the millions of others. <laughs> yeah, and it says, "All right, that's Fergus's car." Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, so and, and and there's a picture taken, and the, and and you've got CCTV everywhere, all over the place, right? I know, so, I know. And, so and, it, it, it's it's filmed everywhere, CCTV everywhere. What do you do? And um, and and Carlton and Carlton, I'm because because I realise we've been banging on for hours. Yeah, we've got to stop, unfortunately. Again, we have to stop because he's but 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 but. This 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 whole conversation brings me to something else that we've spoken about at length in the past. But please, let's do an episode on it. Please, let's do one on Maddie McCann. Yes, let's <laughs> let's 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 do so, because I know you are in, intimately involved. So. Well, no, um, not intimately involved, because that makes it makes out like I yeah, 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 <laughs> had yeah, anything but... to do with it. All I'm saying is, <laughs> all I'm saying is, I've, I, you know, as you know, I've always been fascinated by the minutiae of the case. But mm. given what you've just told me about um, CCTV and cameras and the many conversations that we've had previously about, you know, the, the that is in Britain, though. That is. That is in the United Kingdom, sorry. You know, in many countries, they don't have that. In many countries, they don't allow that. You know, Austria, I remember when I was there in Austria one day and, and I was with the, the head of the Austrian gendarmerie. They used to have two sets of police, gendarmerie and police in those days. They've now just got one, police. Uh, and, and he was the general in charge of it. And I was there with a the guy and he, he said, oh, this is what we've got. We've got a camera which we have on the opera house in Vienna. And you know what we do sometimes? We turn it away to look at the traffic. And he was amazed. I said, listen, General, next time you're in London, give me a shout and I'm going to take you in to the central command in the Metropolitan Police. So it happened about s at Scotland Yard. So it happened about, oh, what was it? About eight months later, maximum, he came and his, his Batman called up, said, oh, the General of the Austrian Police is going and he would want for you to honour what you said you would do and let him see the control rooms in Scotland Yard. So I said, OK. So I get in touch with the commissioner's office. So can I take the general in charge of all the gendarmerie in uh, in Austria? Yes, of course you can. Right. So he comes in and this is like 2002 or something like that. And he walks in and he goes, that is unglaublich. It's unbelievable. He says, this is like Star Trek. It's unbelievable because he couldn't believe all the cameras we had everywhere. He just couldn't believe it. He's thinking, flipping heck, what is this? He says, this is not allowed in, in Austria. This is against dem democracy. It's undemocratic. But I love it. <laughs> oh, but also, I mean, I always think every time I drive past the, the MI5 building, I always think, what a great place to fly a drone off. It <laughs> You're giving people ideas. Stop it. No, no, no. But, but, I mean, it's like, but, but, but drones, but, but, you know, the police must use drones, right? Well, yeah. Look, as I said again, 
don't just talk about the security service, I'm in fact, talk about the police, because the police are the ones using all, a lot of the kit. So yes, the police have done, but the police have helicopters, don't they? Uh, a support unit. Yeah, and, but... And the police can use the cameras. Like, how, much, and, how much does it cost to, to fill up your helicopter these days? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they do the helicopters, they do drones, they do, you know, there's whole loads of stuff because you use every every tactical advantage you can utilise, yeah? And in some cases, a drone's a great tactical advantage, so you need to use it. it these are not things bought willy-nilly, these are things bought to aid and assist. But for everything you do to aid and assist, there's always a positive and a negative. That's, guess, I, that's what this whole show's been about, isn't it? The positive and the negative of both sides of everything that happens. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I, guess, I guess if you said to, uh, yeah, well, I guess if you, if we go back to the ideology of crime, if you said to a criminal, like, why, why did you do it? They would say, because I thought I'd get away with it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, the positive, the positive to them is that you know the the reward they thought they'd reap, and the negative is the <laughs> penalty they pay, but they were prepared to take that risk. Exactly. The last thing I would say, because we have to end, because I'm looking at the time, is we have to end. We don't want to end, but we have to end. Your, your listeners so, will be so bored. So the last thing I'm going to say... They'll be, they'll be, like, sending in messages going, like... Want more. Episodes, oh, hopefully, we want more. Yeah, no, joking aside, the last thing I'm going to say is the very, very last thing, and what I'm going to say is, is this. You get the police you deserve. So if you keep hammering the old bill for everything, you're going to get... A police, and the old bill, by the way, for those in America, is the police, old William, yeah, etc. Um, is that you're going to get a police that, frankly, is frightened of doing anything and does probably very little to prevent what's happening. And I'll leave you on that. That is a that's a good that's a good place to leave it. That's a that's a that's a like think on that let's all think on that let's all think on that and um Carson I look forward to chatting to you again as I do with you as always and I think we're going to make this a regular feature because you're great and I think that you make me think about things that I wouldn't think about so thank you very much Good see you again next week if you'd like to help Carlton keep producing the Black Spy podcast and receive episodes and information that's only available to Carlton's special Patreon agents, then you can donate as little as £3, €4 Euros, or $5 a month by signing up with Patreon. See the Black Spy podcast notes or Google Patreon Black Spy podcast and pledge your monthly amount. You can even win the opportunity to be a guest on the show. Thanks for listening. And don't forget to subscribe for free. Here is a working class spy telling his stories, the secrets, the lives of spies. Feel free to message Carlton King on all socials and give this show five stars on Apple iTunes and subscribe so you never miss a single episode for your ears only. In the quarter of the century, I was a member of the Majesty's Secret Intelligence Service.